Hello, I'm Kelly McFarland, and this is Diplomatic Community from the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. And today, in our boasted modern civilization, we are facing just exactly the same problems, just exactly the same conflict between two schools of philosophy that they faced in the earliest days of America. Welcome to the first episode of our fifth season. This season, we are exploring the strained, battered, yet resilient and increasingly important world of multilateralism. Where better to start than the largest and best-known multilateral institution, the United Nations? Founded out of the ashes of the Second World War, and meant to fix what had failed in the League of Nations, this 77-year-old institution is once again challenged by a war in Europe launched by one of its veto-wielding members. If that weren't enough, the UN is also coordinating responses to a global pandemic, famine, and climate change, while providing peacekeeping operations in multiple active combat zones and carrying on the daily, grinding work of seeking worldwide consensus. Given the breadth and width of the issues facing the United Nations, we chatted with two experts for this episode. First, to set the stage for us is a familiar name to ISD fans, Alistair Somerville. We chatted with him back in October to discuss how this challenging moment fits into the larger history of the United Nations. Alistair Somerville is a staff assistant at the UN Secretariat's office in Washington, the UN Information Center, where he coordinates the Secretariat's work with academic institutions, think tanks, and the media in Washington and around the United States. Alistair is also affiliated with ISD as a non-resident associate and was previously the publications editor and producer of the Diplomatic Community Podcast. Alistair, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, on this side of the uh, screen, this side of the microphone. We're going to put you to the fire on this one today, so we'll see what uh, what you have to come up with here. So, um, so this episode, we're going to talk about the UN, and Alistair, I want you to s- set the stage for us and give us a little background. Um, I'm actually, my class actually just read a book called uh, The History of an Idea by Mark Mazauer, which talks about this idea of supernatural government, international organizations, and all this stuff going back to 1815 is when he starts it. So this idea of what the UN ended up becoming wasn't, you know, wasn't created just in out of blue in 1944, 1945. Um, and, but it was unique in a lot of different ways and important for a number of reasons, obviously. Um, so how did it succeed where other global institutions like the League of Nations that came before it didn't succeed? Well, the United Nations system, as we know it today, formally came into existence in 1945. It's, it's 77 years old. But the idea for the United Nations and the values underpinning it had existed for much longer. The values of the League of Nations that was founded in the aftermath of the First World War, the governance structure of sovereign states, not a world government, but but an organization that could facilitate international cooperation and efforts to bring an end to the type of conflicts that uh, the First World War and then the the Second World War and the destruction that those had wrought on on the world. So those values from the League of Nations, which of course, for myriad reasons, didn't quite live up to the ideals that it had set for itself, were then recast in the form of the United Nations. And in the 1940s, before the organization was formally founded uh, with the signing of the UN Charter at the 1945 San Francisco Conference, there had been many conversations among the allies about what to do in the aftermath of the Second World War and exactly what form of world organization of global governance um, might, might be able to emerge in the aftermath of the conflict. So in around 1942, the term United Nations first came into being. You had the United Nations uh, Social Club in in Washington, D.C. 
the Washington Conversations on International Organization in, in 1944, the Dumbarton Oaks Conference, where that idea for the United Nations organization um, really started to come into fruition. And really an effort to bring along those U.S. domestic political constituencies, most notably the United States Senate, um, which was required in order to bring the U.S. into the organization. You might recall, listeners might might know that the, the U.S., whilst it had been President Woodrow Wilson's driving idea to create the League of Nations after the First World War, the U.S. Senate never approved U.S. entry into the League, which was considered one of its great weaknesses. In the case of the United Nations, the ability to bring the Senate along to to bring that U.S. domestic constituency along was was just one reason why um, the organization was was able to come into being with with a slightly greater chance of of success, and we see the organization develop from there ever since. Well, it's interesting you bring up. Well, I guess it's not interesting because it's all over the news right now, but you bring up the the issue of power in the UN and um, the UN is obviously made up of the permanent five members of the Security Council, Great Britain, France, the United States, China, and Russia, um, formerly the Soviet Union. And, you know, hi- history, it's nothing new to see um, a crisis between some of the P5 members because of the way that um, the, the, the permanent Security Council is organized. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because we are in a moment where with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's kind of back on the front burner and these notions of what can the UN do when Russia is a member of the Permanent Security Council, the P5, and um, others will maybe abstain from doing things. Um, So how has the organization dealt with these ongoing tensions and competition among the P5 members uh, and evolved to better manage these types of relations throughout the decades, but still also being able to take on other action and other multilateral action to deal with the myriad other issues that go beyond great power competition that are ongoing all the time in the world. Yeah. So I think there's, there's sort of two parts to that, that question. There's the part about the security council itself and the fact that its membership, its permanent membership is very much a reflection of the world at the end of the the Second World War and less so a reflection of the world we find ourselves in today. Um, And of course, compared to some of the time period during the Cold War, the Security Council, the fact that it meets almost every day, uh, certainly multiple times a week, has this year alone... um, reauthorized uh, peacekeeping missions in in Lebanon, in uh, Mali, the special political mission in Afghanistan. Um, there's plenty of activity that continues to go on in the Security Council in spite of the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Um, and, and I think Speaking from the the perspective of the organization itself, that's quite remarkable that some of those efforts have managed to continue um, despite all of the political tension and the difficulties that that's caused. I think it shows that there is a willingness in New York um, to compartmentalize a bit and find the issues where there can still be some level of cooperation, at least to, to keep authorizing um, some of these missions around the world, but undoubtedly um, there are plenty of of blockages in the uh, in the Security Council. You know, you you look at issues like Syria, where the um, the, the the great powers, um, particularly the the U.S. and Russia, um, have very very different objectives, and and that that leads to um, impasses or, or very limited mandate. So the Security Council might agree to, in that case, um, extend uh, the humanitarian, uh, the timeline for the humanitarian corridor, but only by six months um, as opposed to a year to get humanitarian assistance into Syria. So, so 
that's one way the the organization has evolved and then of course the UN has has grown with the um agencies funds and programs it's not just the security council that's not the only part of the UN system you of course have um you know the the big the big beasts the UN development program UNICEF the world food program delivering um humanitarian assistance and um longer term economic development projects uh with with in many cases that being the 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 primary lifeline for people uh, millions of people around the world they're not necessarily big political uh successes or or big um achievements in in peace processes but but for many people that's what's keeping them alive uh and 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 shouldn't be shouldn't be overlooked um i think when it comes to the the war in ukraine in particular i think the secretary general has looked to um find ways that despite those constraints the un can still make a a positive contribution um you only need to look at the black sea grain initiative that was signed earlier in the year it's a very limited and specific effort to ease the global food crisis um that's resulted from war in 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 Ukraine one of the the bread baskets of of the world and that really exemplifies an effort to intervene where the UN can have some meaningful contribution so in this case the technical expertise required to actually uh inspect the the grain shipments to to win the um uh cooperation of both Ukrainian and Russian officials to agree to those um inspections um of of vessels that are passing out of the Black Sea uh past Istanbul to to many parts of the world um no one's pretending that that uh that particular initiative is what's going to end the war but it's a very specific intervention that the UN is well placed to to tackle so i think it's been about finding finding avenues to um ease human suffering uh build some level of confidence between um warring parties that that some limited agreements can can be reached it's not necessarily a particularly glamorous or um or high flying um approach to to diplomacy but it's a it's it's an effort to make kind of limited um interventions where where possible you know as you mentioned it's important to sort of keep moving forward on the things you can um knowing and understanding that you there's a lot of things that you can't move forward on because of um the structure as well um but there are a lot of successes that can happen um and as you said keep people fed so all right thanks man i appreciate it thank you again to alistair for that important historical context to better understand the institution as it stands today we also spoke with ambassador jeffrey feltman jeffrey feltman is the john c whitehead visiting fellow in international diplomacy in the foreign policy program at brookings and a senior fellow at the UN Foundation, both based in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Feltman was appointed as the first U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, a position he held from April 2021 until January 2022. From July 2012 until his April 2018 retirement, he served as United Nations Undersecretary General for Political Affairs. From 2009 until 2012, Ambassador Feltman was the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Prior to his 2004 to 2008 tenure as U.S. Ambassador to Lebanon, he served as a U.S. diplomat in Erbil, Baghdad, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Tunis, Amman, Budapest, and Port-au-Prince. Ambassador Feltman, through his unique experience as both a U.S. and U.N. diplomat, takes us on an insightful tour of the key policy challenges for the U.N. in an era of great power competition. He defines the advantages and disadvantages of multilateralism as a tool, highlights the UN programs and institutions that are lesser known but make a big difference for millions of people, and unpacks the reforms that may yet emerge from the current moment. Ambassador Feltman, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. I look forward to the conversation. So just going to hop right into it here to kind of talk to you about this this stuff and some of the, a lot of the issues that the UN is dealing with today. Uh, and you know, we're, we're moving into a period where the world is increasingly dominated once again by great power competition. 
um, whether or not that's you know emanating from a U.S. Russia standpoint, U.S. China, but the U.N. has dealt with these issues before, obviously during the Cold War and everything. But how does the structure of the U.N. in your mind, having worked there and dealt with it, impede or enable progress? on defining these larger UN goals, such as maintenance of peace and security. And obviously the war in Ukraine today is putting that, the, the, these types of issues front and center. That's a very good, it's a very good question. It's one that you know, a lot of people are, are pondering because I think we, those of us of, of my generation has gotten sort of used to the unipolar world that emerged after the end of the Cold War, where the US largely set the agenda, not exclusively, but, but the US, um, had the influence, the power, the relationship to largely set the agenda at the United Nations and on the multilateral system. Russia was focused in, you know, internally. China had not yet um, emerged with the assertive foreign policy that it has that it has today. And so we look at we we sort of look at that unipolar period after the end of the Cold War as the normal. When in fact, as you as your own remarks indicated, we had um, forty some years of the UN under a Cold War period. Um, so I think we have to relearn some of the lessons that we had during that Cold War period to um, address the challenges in today's world. You, know, you look back to the 50s and 60s, for example, you know, it's hard to imagine tougher competition than between the Soviet Union and the United States. But the, and that competition paralyzed some of the issues in, at, at the United Nations. But at the same time, the Soviet Union and the United States worked together, cooperated on issues such as nuclear nonproliferation work to fight, um, to eradicate polio, fight against smallpox. So I think that the name of the game today is to go back to the point where you find areas where you can cooperate um, inside, the, inside the United Nations and the, other, and the other multinational institutions while also competing um, off, you know, off, offline. Now what's different um, today is that unlike in the Cold War, the member states of the United Nations themselves are much more likely to hedge their bets. You know, you, know, you look at, um, at regional powers like Turkey. Turkey was clearly part of the, you know, the, the US alliance during the Cold War. Turkey's not likely to automatically side with the United States today inside these multilateral organizations the way that happened during the Cold War. So for a member state like the United Nations, like the United States, sorry, we have to learn how to make sure that we are building the type of alliances we need um, to influence and, and whenever possible set the agenda in, in the multilateral system in a way that we didn't use that we didn't have to. We didn't have to during the Cold War because there was an ideological split where we had automatic allies. We didn't have to after the end of the Cold War um, because it was more or less a unipolar world temporarily. Now we've got to really learn how to cooperate, build alliances. Um, in some cases, compromise in order to be able to promote um, and protect some of those core issues inside the United Nations. Well, as a historian, I'm never going to not like an answer that uh, leads by uh, looking at history and what we can learn from it. So I appreciate that. And and I think, you know, your point on the U.S. is going to have to work harder than we're used to um, because of the issues you just pointed out on the whether or not it's during the Cold War or the unipolar moment um, where we could kind of had a built-in system of people that were always going to be on our side or could sort of set the agenda post-Cold War. I think we're, you know, we are in a new era. Um, and you, you mentioned a couple of things that move us into my next question. And you mentioned the way that even though the Cold War, Cold War was extremely fraught and contentious in the UN in many aspects, there were points where uh, the, the nations were able to come together to work on other issues, whether or not it was polio or non-proliferation. In today's world, we're, we are living in a world full of transnational issues and existential issues, climate change, food security, you name it. And the in a time period like now, when the UN and the world is so focused on like on something like the war in Ukraine, how does the UN still move forward on trying to answer these bigger questions of climate change and food security and things that affect the entire globe? Um, and is it, does it have the tools to do that? Well, let me go back into history again, since you're, and you, you probably know the history better than, better than I do, since, since you are a historian. But let's think about the League of Nations. The League of Nations 
by the 1930s had become totally um, ineffective, irrelevant. The United States never joined the, the League of Nations for all the reasons we know. The Senate never ratified the, the membership. Um, Japan being criticized by the League of Nations for its aggression in, in, um, in Manchuria withdrew from the League of Nations. Germany withdrew from the League of, from the League of Nations um, under criticism over its, over its aggression. And the League of Nations more or less you know, fell into utter irrelevance at, at a time when, when we most needed the, the League of Nations in the, in the 30s. If someone had said to me on February 23rd or 24th, just as the Russian aggression on Ukraine was beginning, what's going to happen to the United Nations? I would have been afraid that the United Nations would have fallen into the same irrelevance that the League of Nations fell into in the 30s. It hasn't. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised by the resilience of the United, Na of the United Nations system. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't recognize the paralysis in the Security Council on, on questions of war and peace dealing with Ukraine. And of course, war and pe uh, the question of peace is the irreducible purpose of the United Nations. So I'm not, I'm not ignoring where there have been problems. But you look at issues such as the you know, COP26 that just took place in Sharm, in Sharm el-Sheikh. The UN has long called for some kind of mechanism on loss and justice for those countries that are most affected by climate change. Now, there's a lot of questions about what the decisions were, the funding's not there, the timing's not there, there's a lot of questions there, but there was a fundamental shift in the position of um, countries like the United States in agreeing that there has to be some sort of, some sort of compensation un under loss and, loss and um, justice for, for the impact of climate, of climate change. Um, you look at the food security issues. The UN was very quick. I mean, David Beasley, the head of the World Food, Pro World Food Program, at the initial stages of Russia's war in Ukraine, immediately raised the alarm bells on the question of food security, um, what this would mean for global food prices and thus people's ability to, to feed themselves. And the UN has the UN has jumped in, and I think in a very effective and creative way, with the help of countries like countries like Turkey. Even on the peace and security side, there was a real controversy over the UN mission in Libya, the special political mission that's that's trying to trying to help the Libyans reunify the institutions of the state in order to move forward. Um, the Security Council came together behind the mandate for for Libya. They came together behind the mandate for the UN to play in Afghanistan. So the UN effective in some of these areas where I might have predicted the UN is going to be completely paralyzed because of the, because of Ukraine. Again, on Ukraine, the Security Council will remain will remain paralyzed for the for the reasons we know. But overall, I think that you have seen the type of resilience and creativity in the system that even though I was inside the system, I wouldn't have predicted. Yeah, I think that you mentioned the grain deal, and I think that's a perfect example of sort of the the um, importance and resiliency and resourcefulness of the UN and, and why it's it's needed uh, in many aspects. And I think they, they've they done a good job on things like that to see it and then to fix it um, and move forward from that. But um, well, and, and, and if I can interrupt, um, look at how the grain deal came together again. I, I don't want to I don't want to minimize Turkey's role, Turkey's access. President Erdogan's access to President Putin um, and, the, and Turkey's support for um, some of the military operations inside Ukraine, the Ukrainians with the drones, gave Turkey a um, influence on this. But what, what there were was there not there wasn't just one grain deal. There were two. There was one set of negotiations about getting Russian grains and Russian fertilizers out of Russian ports, you know, despite sanctions. And the other was about getting the Ukrainian grain, Ukrainian foodstuffs out of out of Odessa port and out of out of Ukraine. And these were two separate negotiations in terms of the process, but they were linked so that the Russians had an incentive to move forward with allowing the Ukraine exports to move, because they could then also make sure that they were not going to be sanctioned for trying to get their exports to remove. And there was one very complicated uh, part of this that's really interesting which was ammonia exports from Russia go via a pipeline to Odessa. Um, 
And, um, and Russia's ammonia exports are a key part of fertilizer um, that's, used, that's used globally. And the biggest purchaser is the United States, or United States companies of, of Russian ammonia that comes through a dust support. So trying to put this together in a creative way where all sides had an incentive to support the deal, I think showed um, real innovation on the part of the United Nations. And there were many different parts of the United Nations, International Maritime Organization, the UN Conference for Trade and Development, parts of the UN that we never think about that became essential in bringing this together. So I was deeply impressed, even having worked inside the United Nations, or maybe because I worked inside the United Nations, I was deeply impressed by the coherence and the creativity that the UN system brought to bear on these um, export deals of grain, fertilizer, foodstuffs from Russia and, and Ukraine. And you've seen the impact of that on global food markets in that the, in that the spikes of food prices have alleviated somewhat since this grain deal was signed. You mentioned the fact that, and I mentioned it in the open as well, that you worked at the UN. And that one of the one of the great benefits of interviewing you for this episode is the fact that you do have the unique experience of serving as both a high-ranking U.S. diplomat and as a high-ranking U.N. diplomat. So talk to us a little bit about how do you compare the two experiences? What was it, you know, working in the U.S. and the in that unipolar moment and, and on a lot of bilateral and multilateral ways and negotiations and then working in an international body like the UN. And then also a follow on to that, does it or has it given you an appreciation for things that are best left to the bilateral realm or that are, are more suited for the international realm in like re in regional bodies or something like the UN. I mean, I'll be honest with you. When I um, when I re retired from the State Department and took up the position of Under Secretary General for Political Affairs at the United Nations, I underestimated how different the two jobs would be. I had assumed, okay, I'd been a U.S. diplomat for you know um, going on thirty years. I'd been doing diplomacy for a long time. I'd worked with the UN overseas. I'd never been in, I'd never worked with the UN in New York. Um, I'd never been posted to the US mission, which is sort of like the US embassy to the UN. But I thought, well, this is going to be more or less the same sort of thing I did, except that my bosses will now be an international system rather than you know US government. It was actually far different um, in terms of in terms of the trade craft, in terms of the skills that one that one needs to try to be effective. Um, I used to tease my UN staff that. The UN made me have real appreciation for the nimbleness and flexibility of the US State Department, um, which were not words that I tended to use when I worked for the State Department, I assure you. Um, I mean, yes, a lot of the stories that you hear about you know, UN bureaucracy are true. Um, and part of that are different member states imposing different rules. Um, part of it is self-inflicted with the UN bureaucracy itself um, envelops you in various rules and regulations. Some of this, of course, was developed because the UN had a problem of nepotism. There's been some corruption issues from time to time. So some of this was just checks and balances. But yeah, so it is a, it is a more bureaucratic environment than the US government, as hard as that may be to believe for people who've only worked in the US government. But there also, there's also a real upside that I, that I appreciated almost from day one. When I would you know, as the Undersecretary General for Political Affairs, I was supposed to be monitoring the peace and security portfolio globally. You know, um, where were issues where the UN needed to engage? Where were issues where we needed to bring up, bring, bring to the attention of the UN Security Council, which has the real authority on peace and security matters? Where, what did I need to let the Secretary General know we needed to be doing on peace and security? So I would gather my staff, my senior staff in the morning. We would have, we would sit down around the table, talk about the world's problems, and the world was at the table. You know, my Afri one of my Africa advisors had been a child soldier in Mozambique fighting the Portuguese um, um, colonizers. Now, as smart and as diverse as people around the Situation Room table in the White House may be, you don't have that kind of diversity across the board. So it, it really opened my eyes to whole different perspectives of how to look at some of the, some of the global issues we were facing. I really appreciated that. But in terms of the tradecraft, I mentioned that the tradecraft was um, quite different between the two jobs. And the, the, and the main point, I think, is that to be effective inside the United Nations as a, as a UN official, 
or as a member state of the United Nations, the whole name of the game is consensus. You have to build a sufficient consensus in order to be able to have an impact. In order to be able, you have to be able to attract enough support for an idea to be able to move forward. Now, when you're a U.S. diplomat and you have U.S. policy, of course, you want consensus. You know, when you're when you're going overseas, you're working at an you're working at an embassy. You 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 would like the host government to agree with with what we're proposing. You'd like the host government to support whatever the U.S. policy is. But in the end, if a particular host government doesn't support a policy, the U.S. had the power to go on go on its own. Whether or not we should is a different question. You desired consensus, but it wasn't essential to have consensus as a U.S. diplomat, as a U.N. official. If you don't have consensus, you get nowhere. If you don't have member states, first of all, your UN colleagues inside the UN secretariat, the UN agencies, funds, and programs behind you, and then you don't have member states behind you, you can't go anywhere. So it really was it really was essential to, to build consensus, which is different from being a US diplomat hoping for consensus, but not requiring it. Um, in terms of the, your second, the second part of your question about when is it appropriate to bring things to the to the international organization versus bilaterally. Um, I think that, that, that more and more, we do need to bring things multilateral because as your introductory comments pointed out, so many of the challenges we face today are multinational, they're not bilateral. But given how polarized the world is, what it seems to me the right approach is to be working bilaterally on multi multiple fronts in order to build enough consensus to bring something to the multilateral system. You know, I don't, for example, let's take, let's take Ukraine again. I do not believe that the United Nations will solve the Ukraine war, will, will end Russia's aggression in Ukraine. But what might happen is that you have, the, you have negotiations, talks, they're taking place outside the UN context. But the only way to get them to be sort of broadly accepted is to then bring them into the UN context. Um, so, and this could, this can apply on technical issues as well. You know, you have you want to talk about um, what to do on certain issues on climate change. Talking about a melee in the UN context with 193 member states is probably not very going to be very constructive because people are going to be it's going to be a performative act. People are going to be talking, talking about talking in a way that their home audiences, their home governments would appreciate. You need to work bilaterally on multiple fronts and then expand the conversation. And once you have sufficient weight um, behind a certain idea, then bring it to the United Nations for endorsement um, and for the type of funding and burden sharing that might need to, for implementation. The UN for all of its flaws, for all of the questions we all have about the UN at times, it is an accepted means of burden sharing. It is the only organization that has the power to set global norms with the force of international law. So bring things later to the United Nations, don't start at the United Nations, would be my advice. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I, I think a good example of that too would be the the Paris climate deal and the way that the U.S. worked with China for years before that to, to, to come to an agreement between those two before taking it to the international level um, to where we could get agreement at, at Paris. But um, you mentioned things like the, food, the World Food Program and the trade body that's within the United Nations. But what are some of the other programs and things that the U.N. does that our listeners might not be so familiar with that you think are going to be or are extremely important and worth mentioning? I mean, there's a bewildering array of UN agencies, funds, and programs and conventions that affect much of much of the international system, much of which we don't pay any attention to. You know, the International Civil Aviation Organization is part of the UN system, you know, that that, that governs the use of airspace. But a couple I would point out that, that are probably not as well known. One would be about half of the world's children every year have their childhood vaccinations um, provided by UNICEF. Many of us are familiar with, with UNICEF, you know, the Christmas cards, is that, you know, I think UNICEF has a good reputation in the United States. It's um, traditionally been headed by, a, by an American citizen, but around 50% of all children every year get their childhood vaccinations via UNICEF. I think that's a very important, very important thing because we, we want to try to prevent pandemics. We want to try to prevent um, childhood diseases that that could um, prevent a child growing up into re realizing his or her uh, potential. 
And this is this is one that was part of my uh, part of my department, the Department of Political Affairs, now Political and Peace Building Affairs, the Election Assistance Division. The UN, at the request of host governments, works in about 50 countries a year. That's almost a quarter. That's a little over a quarter of the membership, the 193 members of the United Nations, at these governments' request, in order to build um, election systems that are credible, that have integrity, that um, would be would be seen would, that the, that the population of these countries would have confidence in, and given some of the some of the strains in in democracies globally, I think this is really important. It's to find ways to try to support governments that request the UN support in building credible elections, credible election systems. That's just something else that the UN that the UN does is probably um, not very well known by you know by many people, and, and it's sort of intentional. You know, if 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 the UN successfully helps country X build an election system. You want country X to be proud of that election system. You don't want the UN to take credit for it. You want country X to take credit for it. So, uh, so a lot of the stuff that the UN does is intentionally sort of unsung. So last question, uh, we'll get you out of here on a, on a super easy question. Um, but, uh, you know, we, you, you mentioned in the earlier in one of your answers, the, the Ukraine issue and the the inability in many ways for the UN to to try to bring you mentioned the role the UN may play in the long run, but trying to go, get peace by going through the UN initially, the Security Council hinders a lot of that. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about well, there's always a lot of talk about UN reform, um, but there was statements at the at UNGA in September. Even President Biden mentioned uh, Security Council reform. So. What are your thoughts on Security Council reform? What what would you see as the best avenue to move forward on some sort of uh, workable reform? Well, I very much welcome President Biden uh, making reference to that in his um, address to the general to the General Assembly high level debate back in September. I think it was a very positive thing to do, um, and I think it's something that the U.S. should continue to push. Um, I mean, look at to, look at the Security Council today. Okay, you've got the five permanent members. We're all, you know, the U.S., Russia, China, France, U.K. You've got five permanent members. You have 10 elected members. They're elected for two-year terms. If you look today at the Security Council today, Ireland and Norway are among the elected members. So, so you have Ireland and Norway, the U.K. and France, four members out of 15 from Western Europe. Do do we think that um, that percentage of the population or political power or economic power rests in Western Europe today? It doesn't. I mean, the Security Council does not reflect today's demography, today's political or economic power. And, and so I'm glad that President Biden raised this. The challenge is that the, mem- that the 193 member states of the United Nations are divided in multiple ways about how you would reform the Security Council. And it lets countries like ours, it lets countries like the United States off the hook because there is no single proposal from the member states to the Security Council, to the permanent five, to say this is what Security Council reform should look like. Now, President Biden made reference in his speech to, um, I don't remember his exact words, but he said, including those that we've long thought should be on the Security Council, something like that. I mean, that's a, that's a clear reference, um, I would guess, to Germany, Japan, India, maybe Brazil. That those are those are often talked about as the as the likely candidates for for permanent membership on the Security Council, given the given the given their their weight internationally today. Okay, if you're China, if you're Beijing, do you want to see Germany, India, and Japan join the Security Council? I would doubt it, but you but China is probably not going to say that publicly. If you're Pakistan, you're probably going to get your your um, Islamic allies to come up with ways behind the scenes to make it harder for India to become a permanent member. You've got the Africans with you know growing demographic weight in Africa. Um, much of the UN's peace and security work is on the African continent. The Africans have a legitimate case for saying we need a greater voice on the Security Council. But if it comes down to two members of Africa becoming um, permanent members, is that South Africa, given its weight? Is it Algeria, given its traditional role? Is it, is it um, Nigeria, the most populous country? Is it Ethiopia, the head of the African Union? You know, so, so I think that the, the five permanent members basically 
have been able to just sort of watch this quibble among the member states about what it, about what this Security Council reform would look like, and it lets them off the hook. So I think that President Biden raising this, I think it was sincere. I don't think this was just a PR thing to put China in the corner. Um, I think can encourage the member states to try to work together on on a, on a consensus of what Security Council reform should look like. But let me let me also point out though. Adopting new tools, something you mentioned in an earlier question, um, adopting reforms doesn't always doesn't necessarily require Security Council reform. Look at peacekeeping. Nowhere in the UN Charter is peacekeeping mentioned. And yet the United Nations was able with member state support to develop peacekeeping as one of the tools on peace and security. So my suggestion at this point would be, yes, continue to try to push for Security Council reform. I don't think it's going to be I don't think it's going to be. Um, feasible in the short term for the reasons I mentioned, but you can look at how you tweak the system, how you come up with new tools um, that might get support of member states sufficient to, to add them to the UN's toolbox. Yeah, as you mentioned, not an, not an, e not an easy solution out there, but um, hopefully with statements like President Biden's, it will spur activity uh, moving towards some sort of solution in the future. Uh, Ambassador Feltman, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I think that's been a great conversation and uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Ambassador Feltman and Alistair Somerville for their time and thoughts. Stay tuned for our next episode where we begin exploring how multilateralism works at the regional level. We'll be talking with Jessica Le Pen, the U.S. Ambassador to the African Union. Until we meet again. This episode was produced by Daniel Henderson. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Be sure to check out any episodes you may have missed via our website. Please rate, review, and follow this podcast wherever you listen, and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else they listen. Follow us on Twitter, at GU Diplomacy, and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu, to learn more about our work.